And will you pray with me this morning? Loving, gracious God, I ask that the words of my mouth, the meditations, the thoughts, the ponderings of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For we know that we know that you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. It's hard to believe that it, this Sunday is the sixth Sunday of the sermon series, The Best is Yet to Come. I had someone say to me yesterday, I've missed three of them. I said, well, you can go back and watch them on Facebook. But it's been kind of fun to talk about The Best is Yet to Come. And the next Sunday, on October 30th, we'll be celebrating Highland Hope's 26th birthday as a church. 26 years. Started as a dream, as a hope. And look what God has done and is doing and will do. That's the whole point of this series is to remind us that the best isn't behind us. The best is truly yet to come. How many of you remember the movie, Mary Poppins? I'm sure most of you do. There are some younger people here in the crowd that may not remember Mary Poppins, but maybe they've seen it on TV, or maybe they remember Nanny McPhee, or maybe that's still kind of old for some people. But remember that song she sang, Just a spoonful of sugar Helps the medicine go down in the most delightful way. Oh, yeah, thanks. You think that's funny? Oh, never mind. We'll talk about that later. Mary Poppins sang this song, like I said, in the 1964 movie. Oh, that's painful. 1964 movie to get the kids that she was in charge of to try to open up their mouths and swallow this nasty taste and stuff that they had to take every day. We could call it sugar coating. Just a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. You know, sometimes we have a tendency to sugarcoat everything, don't we? Make things sound better than they really are. We sugarcoat things. It's our attempt to disguise something that is truly awful. You know, when you give your kids medicine, you put it in applesauce or ice cream or chocolate milk or juice, but they still can taste it. It's still there. And they sometimes pick up on that trick and, I don't want that. We love to take our sourest lemons and we love to turn them into lemonade. But I want to let you know that this attempt to sugarcoat things, to, to sugarcoat the negative, this really isn't part, excuse me, part of our biblical faith. We are believers in a faith that is founded on the crucifixion of our Savior. Our Savior who was crucified and treated as a blasphemous criminal. There's no way to sugarcoat that. Because Jesus never sugarcoated anything. We've been watching The Chosen the past spring and this, this fall. And we've talked about how Jesus spoke openly. He didn't sugarcoat anything when he spoke to his clueless disciples. He was trying to prepare his disciples for his impending arrest, his conviction, his execution. 
And then Jesus boldly declared that the poor will always be with you and advised the rich young man that the cost, cost of discipleship was to sell everything if you wanted to follow Jesus. Discipleship was never advertised as a simple thing. It was never sugar-coated. It was never ad- advertised as anything but a big ticket item by Jesus. Discipleship is a commitment that as its reward demanded its followers to take up their cross and follow Jesus. And so we have our Apostle Paul, our reading from Romans today. We remember that Paul had first-hand experience at the hardships of that discipleship. He knew what following Jesus could bring to one's life. Paul never sugarcoated the cost of discipleship because Paul knew through his own experience what the cost of discipleship really was. In the book of Romans, Paul lists some of the things, some of the hardships, some of the costs of discipleship, some of the things that we as Christians might go through, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, the sword. And Paul had personally experienced all of these things except the final blow of the sword. But Paul could personally testify that none of those things, none of those things could separate us from the love of Christ. The love of Christ was the saving sacrificial, redeeming work of Christ on the cross. The work that brought salvation and eternal life to all who believe. There is no need to sugarcoat the Christ story because the ending it offers is a miraculous, splendid sweetness of salvation. Remember that commercial from years ago How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? Thank you, John. A one, a two, a three. That's how many licks it takes to the center of a Tootsie Pop. No, the world will never know. But we do know what it takes to get to the sweetness the powerful, life-changing gift of salvation. It takes faith. And Paul doesn't pretend that following Jesus will be a trouble-free ride. In fact, following Jesus can almost guarantee hardships, persecution, peril. They'll be our constant companions. If you're looking for a Risk-free existence? Don't follow Jesus. The center of God's will is not the center of fame and fortune. But what Paul wants the first century Christian readers in Rome to know, and us, all of us believers in Highland, Illinois in the 21st century, is that despite all that happens to us, faith itself is the ultimate victory, the supreme triumph. Whatever the battle is we face, the final outcome is never in question when we stay connected to Christ. The world's eyes may record distress, famine, even death. But the eyes of faith see that there is nothing Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. That's Romans 8, 38-39. And I repeat, there is nothing in the universe that will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing... Just as the art world proclaims beauty is in the eye of the beholder, people know that faith is the victory.
Remember the history of the nation of Israel. Remember the story when, nation, when Israel was just a fledgling family of faith. There was a truly memorable event that showed us a confrontation between power and faith. I think everybody knows the story. Maybe we've heard it from different names, but we remember the story of David and Goliath. Or perhaps it's Luke and Darth Vader. Or perhaps it's Harry Potter and Voldemort. About the victory of faith over power. The seemingly small and weak and how they ultimately triumph over the vast and the powerful and the vigorous. For Christians, for those whose convictions to act lie in Christ, the moment of triumph is different. And it's distinctly different. With the eighth Harry Potter movie, Voldemort is finally defeated in a to-the-death match with Harry. And Harry wins. In Star Wars, the triumph over the Alliance is complete when the Empire and its evil leader are destroyed. But as Christians, it can be discouraging because there is no definitive action. There is no final battle that marks the point of victory for men and women of faith. In the confrontation between living as a person who is in Christ and the faithless powers of the world, there is no crushing mortal blow Christians can claim as a victory. Sometimes we're caught in that struggle. But I want to let you know that the win that we have in this world is the victory of faith. Faith. A faith that is so secure and so sure that it knows that nothing, nothing separates us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. There is nothing we can do to make God love us less. There is nothing we can do to make God love us more. A faith victory is not counted on the battlefield. The faith victory sprouts in our spirit. David's victory over Goliath didn't occur when the great warrior fell. Have you thought about that before? The the victory wasn't when Goliath fell. David's victory came when a scrawny shepherd boy listened to God, stepped out in faith, scooped up stones, and put him in his sling. David's faith was the victory over the powers that would destroy God's mission. Everything that happened after David stooping down to pick up those stones was but a commentary on a victory that had already been won. It may have taken years or even lifetimes for that Goliath to come tumbling down, but that was not the victory. The victory was won when David had the faith to step out and take up the mission. Christians aren't promised triumph on the battlefield. Christians are promised the triumph of faith. Followers of Jesus find victory in trusting and obeying God. We are a great faith people. And I want to say something that may seem a little politically incorrect as the image of Mary Poppins singing spoonful of sugar. I'm calling you to supersize your faith. Not supersize your meal at McDonald's. Supersize your faith. We are great faith people. Being in Christ is the one supersize that is good for your heart. Not bad for it. 
with the supersized faith in the love of God through Christ Jesus, there is nothing. Nothing. I want you to say nothing. Nothing that can separate us from the love of God. We need to be reminded that even when they, we seem to be losing battles, when we seem to be losing some skirmishes in our day-to-day struggle with, with evil and justice, with whatever is going on, the battle has already been won. Jesus won the victory over evil and death in his death and resurrection. We participate in that victory when we take steps and leaps of faith to join Jesus in his ongoing mission in the world. When the going gets tough, it takes patience, persistence, and it takes perspective. That was the advantage that Paul had. He could deal with things like shipwrecks and beatings and humiliations and imprisonment because he believed that the hardships he was experiencing in his life were nothing compared to the glory that he would receive one day because he was a faithful follower of Jesus. What a difference that proper perspective makes. There was a story of a little boy whose life was made miserable by a bully. This bully constantly pushed him around and picked on him. One day this little boy was sitting in his living room with a new telescope that his father had given to him. But he was looking at the large end of the telescope. His father came in and told him that he needed to use the other end of the telescope so that things would look bigger. But the boy said, I'm looking at Jimmy. And I don't want to see Jimmy any bigger. This way, he looks small, and I'm not afraid of him. Wouldn't it be great if to have a telescope that we could turn around every so often when we faced problems so that we could, we could make our problems seem smaller? But usually we do the opposite, don't we? Because of our, our fear, our anxiety, our stress, we sometimes take those molehills, and we turn them into mountains. So once in a while, we need to stop and get our lives back into the proper perspective. What is it that is really important to us? Just how big is that mountain that we are facing really? I'd be willing to bet that a lot of our problems aren't as big as we think we are, as they, as we think they are. So we need patience. We need persistence. We need perspective. And we need prayer. Prayer to help us find our proper perspective. Patience, persistence, perspective, prayer. And here's one more. Another P. Perspiration. Sometimes the key is to simply keep working. Nels Ferrer was a great scholar. He wrote some marvelous books. In one of these books, he talks about a dream his wife had which gave him his philosophy on worrying. She was sitting at a table with pen and paper, and she had been given a task of writing down the answer to the question, how can I quit worrying? And so in her dream, she wrote at a great length, pages and pages. But when she woke up, the only thing she would remember from all those pages she had written were three words, worship, work, and wait. Worship, work, and wait. Those seems like pretty good words to remember. We know the going gets tough for all of us sometimes. Our lives may seem easy compared to Paul's. 
He, but he never lost his enthusiasm. Never lost his zeal. His great faith allowed him to keep going and to be victorious over the obstacles that confronted him. Patience, perspective, persistence, prayer, perspiration, worship, work, wait. Remember that poster with the cat hanging on by one claw on the branch? Just hang in there. And keep in mind these words that Paul wrote, I consider the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. That was a song from the 80s. Worship, work, wait, pray, persist. Let God confirm in you the idea, the truth that the best is yet to come. And I don't say that flippantly or carelessly. As a follower of Jesus Christ, I truly believe that. Let us pray. Gracious God, We admit that we sometimes let our struggles, our troubles, our doubts, our fears get in the way. But Lord, you remind us that nothing will ever separate us from your love and that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Help us to trust completely and to know that what we go through now is inconsequential to what was waiting for us as your followers. Oh Lord Jesus, we love you. And we know that you love us. Thank you. Amen.